excited to have um, Dr. Jackie Bates Gaston as our guest. Jackie has been an inspiration to every forensic psychologist I know. Um, she's been the chief psychologist of the Northern Ireland Prison Service for over 21 years, and she worked as an occupational psychologist in the public and private sectors and as a lecturer in psychology at the University of Ulster. <laughs> and um, before joining the prison service, she did all of that. Um, and she's a chartered forensic psychologist, psychodynamic therapist. Um, Jackie's worked in the prisons in Northern Ireland during the Troubles, which is really interesting to hear her speak about. Um, she's worked on the parole board and she's recently been awarded the British Psychological Society um, for her distinguished contribution to psychology. She's also very humble so I know she won't like me saying all that about her. But, um, <laughs> it needs to be said and we love to we love to celebrate the work. Um, so welcome Jackie and um, we're really glad to speak to you today and thanks for giving up your time because we know how busy you are. Um, so we just wondered if you'd uh, mind telling us a bit about how you got into forensic psychology psychology? Well, I suppose it's important to think about how I got into psychology because actually at school it was never mentioned as a possible career. <laughs> My mum decided that we weren't going into the bank or into the civil service because in those days, in the 60s, you had to give up your occupation if you got married, which is unbelievable actually when we look back now, but uh, that was the time. So she decided we all had to have a profession and that was good. Um, but we didn't quite, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. I did think of anthropology because I'm really interested in people and how people live and how we're very alike others, despite where we are in the world. And uh, so those similarities and differences were very appealing to me. Um, I did live next door to Robin Farr, who was actually an industrial psychologist, I think, back in the day. Although I didn't know him very well. I knew his dad better. I used to help his dad in his garden uh, with his dahlias. And um, I, I think I, I arrived in in uh, Queens, um, not quite sure what I was going to do, but in those days you were allowed to have four options. Um, so I, I chose psych psychology, I chose English, um, biology, and I think I've forgotten what the other one was, physiology or something. And then you could decide where you wanted to go. So after year one, I definitely decided to want to do psychology. I think that was because I was very curious about why people did what they did and, and um, what made them what they were and why we were all so different in many ways and how we were influenced by our experiences. So getting into forensic psychology was a big leap because first of all, um, my, my interest, uh, again, I used to have painful periods and I used to wonder if that actually had an adverse effect on my examination performance, for instance. So I chose that as my undergraduate study uh, for my degree. And luckily enough, um, we were having a new professor arrive from Cambridge, Dr. Mark Haggard, and he brought a team over and they were interested in different types of uh, speech perception and auditory research. And he looked at my undergraduate thesis and invited me to join the team uh, because he thought uh, menstruation and uh, auditory perception, there is a link and that he wanted to explore that. So I spent a year with that team and had great fun, um, but I knew I didn't want to keep doing that. I wanted to do something very applied because I think psychology has got so much to offer the world and almost everybody I can think of that I wanted to be able to apply my psychology. I love the lectures on um, animal psychology and all about Jane Goodall and I love child development stuff. Um, so, I, But I also was interested in uh, business psychology and it was called industrial psychology in those days. And so I um, finished my master's with Mark and the team and decided to do a master's in occupational psychology. And there was only three of us on the course site. And you think, how decadent <laughs> these days. There'd be probably 300 or something or 30 at least. So we were very privileged to have a very small team with almost two full-time lecturers looking after us. And I got really absorbed by that and had my eyes set on a job in rehabilitation. Um, because um, I, I knew someone who had come in to talk to us about rehabilitation. And so my interest was sparked in rehabilitation, uh, both physical and uh, mental health rehabilitation. And I worked in a rehabilitation unit for nearly five years in the then Department of Manpower. I know, Department of Manpower. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then someone said, look, we'd like to come work at the University of Ulster. And we're really into applied psychology. So I joined them for about 10 years. I love that. Um, and I developed again my research in uh, menstruation and menopause and health. Actually, health psychology was coming uh, into vogue in those days. And I had many students actually doing research projects in health. 
And again, they were doing things on postnatal depression, as it was called then. Um, again, menstruation, menopause. And again, it's very interesting how we were perceived as women in the workplace. And um, my PhD is actually on, on performance during the menstrual cycle. And again, it involves something about what do managers think, both male and female managers. And it's incredible how stereotypic, actually, some of the responses were. Now, that was 19 the early 1980s, I think I submitted in 1986, 87. So um, it was of its time. Um, but I'm still very curious as to the special bits about women. I mean, we are very unique. Uh, to have periods is something very special. Um, and uh, um, it's also a mystery because culturally throughout the world, um, every culture treats menstruation almost as a taboo. Mm -hmm. um, and in some places uh, like Southeast Asia, uh, even today, uh, they don't encourage you to go into temples if you're menstruating. Mm -hmm. So consider that, you know, it's, and I, I'm very pleased to see that there's some people actually getting interested in the area again, because it's an area that was um, not very popular or uh, re well researched when I was an undergraduate. So I'm pleased to see people are coming around to it again. And uh, so how did I get into forensic? Well, um, I just happened to be browsing through a paper. Uh, the Belfast Telegraph and there's very tiny ads saying psychologists wanted for the prison service and I applied for that job and uh, was offered it but of course all my colleagues were saying don't be silly working the prison service Jackie you've got to be joking that's going to be a step too far but it was uh, actually 24 years Jerry uh, in the prison <laughs> service <laughs> and every one of them was a, a definitely a life sentence to some extent um, it was a challenge but it was great fun I loved working with people I loved working with the prisoners I really enjoyed um, trying to make a difference using psychology. Jackie, is there anything that you haven't done? <laughs> <laughs> what I did find, Emily, was occupation was very useful in prisons. It was, you know, it's all about organisational. How do you get people to come with you? How do you influence people? How do you get to the decision makers? And I suppose one of the most frustrating things I find was not the prisoners. They were great to work with, uh, although it was very challenging. Um, 1991 uh, to go into prisons and uh, there was huge uh, tension between the, the various paramilitary groups and um, I was asked obviously to to try and advise and help um, but I immediately I think within the first month we had a tragic uh, death of two prisoners in the bomb explosion in Belfast prison and I realized the effects of trauma and what we needed to do to address uh, the trauma for both the prisoners and the staff following that incident and I was only in a month but I realized really psychology could make a difference here and um, I actually did the first debrief the prison service had ever had that night that terrible tragic night and realized actually that practices like opening up the drinks cabinet after a riot or after a traumatic incident like that was commonplace so I questioned that and then they were driving home full of adrenaline and full of uh, um the, the contents of the, the governor's cabinet and um, questioning just very basic things like that in terms of was that healthy, was that wise, um, was something that they actually hadn't really thought about from a, um, normally now these days we would think about things like that, but the early 90s, um, it was just good, it was seen as good practice just to uh, uh, reward the staff after um, a traumatic evening and then ask them to drive you know to, to drive home afterwards so we changed things after that I was on the senior management board um, which was great psychology was at the very top of the, the prison service and that was great because in terms of influencing I was also the only woman in the room every time so that was a bit of a challenge and uh, going to the governor's conferences and stuff I mean it, 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 back in the 90s it was really very male dominated so I had to use my skills, my interpersonal skills, to be able to influence and, and get people on side to, to make a difference and make a change. And obviously to help them realise that um, uh, this is their idea and they could take this forward and they could benefit from it. How did you, can you say more about how you did that? So you used your interpersonal skills, but can you tell us more? I want to learn. <laughs> well, I'd had an induction into the civil service in my Department of Manpower days, so I'd had nearly five years learning about being a psychologist in the civil service, and th those were very beneficial. I mean, uh, I realised that um, my bosses were all generalists. They weren't experts in their field, 
and they would come and go. So every two to three years, you had a different senior manager at, at the, at, uh, that you reported to. And my job was really to educate that senior manager. And I, after 24 years, I got a bit tired of educating <laughs> the next civil servant. But if, if you could enthuse them with this would be a good idea and it might help their career, then very often they, they were on board quite quickly. Um, senior civil servants, as you know, if you've worked in that field, um, are generalists and, and it is very difficult for them to grasp concepts that one day they're Department of Agriculture, next day the Department of Education, and the next phase of their development might be prisons. Those are huge steps. And as an occupational psychologist, we were taught very firmly that you never did a job without training, specific training, and that you had to be competent and you had your CPD. The civil service is a very different world. So they expect just to be able to turn their hand to anything. And I find that really quite a challenge to be able to help them move forward and to understand some of the fundamental issues that uh, we were facing in things like rehabilitation. How do you get uh, long-term unemployed back to work in Belfast? Because it was a huge problem in Northern Ireland. We had very, uh, very high unemployment rate. And then when I went into prisons, how do you get staff to return to work having been injured on a landing? And the policy then was to go back to the same place that you were assaulted to continue on with your duties when you when you recovered from your physical and, and mental injuries. So I, I suggest that things like, well, maybe if we put them on a return to work plan, uh, maybe if we let them go to a different establishment to gain their confidence again and to get their confidence back, we would actually maybe be more successful in getting people to return to work. Um, that was initially rejected because some civil servant had decided, well, that's what we should do. So I had to work quite hard to get that policy reversed. Uh, but we did, we did, and uh, that's where it is today. Uh, proper rehabilitation route, uh, using again early experience to inform my prison work. Uh, and then of course, rehabilitation with our prisoners. Um, I relied greatly on my colleagues, colleagues from OBPU in, in London, people like Ruth Mann, people like Linda Blood, uh, people like David Thornton. They were all great assets in helping me establish uh, the normal type of prison psychology system that you would see in England. And they were developing all the programs. And so I had to then convince the staff that it was a good idea that we worked with prisoners um, and that it wasn't just about being in a conflictual situation on a day-to-day -day basis, but we needed to move forward with rehabilitation for our prisoners. So there were connections, which I maybe wasn't even conscious about at the time, but I was using earlier skills to influence uh, my work in prisons. And um, I think, I think really um, we have to be good with people in terms of being able to help uh, make changes and bring people with us. And so we do have to use those soft skills sometimes to, to encourage people to move forward in a different direction or in a direction they hadn't looked at before. One thing you do really well in Northern Ireland is your um, connection with um, the Parliament. Remember, we came over to a meeting in Belfast and, and had a meeting in Stormont, which was really exciting. And the Christmas tree was up and it was just beautiful. It was amazing to be there. Um, and I think that's really one thing I admire about how you work in Northern Ireland, being that close. And then we heard your name being mentioned in our Parliament of, of the good work you've done and the report you'd written and, and how that needed to be worked. So we're really proud that you're, you know, somehow, despite all the politics you may be trying to avoid in the Northern Ireland Prison Service, you've actually, in other ways, got very involved in politics as forensic psychologist. Yes, well, we, we were very keen to uh, share our experiences uh, with um, our, our uh, colleagues and MLAs in Stormont. And we, they are very helpful, actually, across, right across the board, very mm -hmm. helpful in, in allowing us to put on events, uh, conferences, seminars. And uh, one seminar that we invited Ruth Mann to, um, we had a circle before Ruth came, she was delayed on a flight. And we had a circle of uh, MLAs, some of whom had actually both served in the maze. <laughs> <laughs> and they were sitting in the same circle talking about how we can improve things in prisons. And I thought that was great because um, we had cross community. Mm. And um, I do find that obviously in Northern Ireland, we're a very small community. You have to remember we're like 1.6 to 1.7 million. Um, so um, it is like a large uh, dysfunctional family <laughs> at times. But we just have a big family even for Ireland. <laughs> 
<laughs> there are many, there are many uh, resonances there between the dysfunctional family and our politics, um, and who's getting the best and who, who needs more. Um, so I think it, it, it is very, they're very accessible and I've always found going and, uh, or going and knocking on doors and talking to people, uh, the reception's always been good. I have never found MLAs uh, resistant to listening. Um, but it's getting past the civil servants sometimes <laughs> to get to the minister. Um, that is a bit of a challenge, but we, we seem to manage very well here with the BPS Northern Ireland. And you've mentioned Ruth a few times at her anniversary this weekend, wasn't it? Two years, of, sadly, since she left us. But um, yeah, she was an amazing psychologist and certainly one we, we still all miss and think about regularly. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I was uh, thinking about her the other day and uh, mm -hmm. thinking, I don't know where the time has gone. No, no. And so can you tell us some of the, I mean, you've touched on a bit, some of the challenges you faced. I mean, you're clearly in a male dominated world, which as Emily's recent research has shown, hasn't changed dramatically in all the... Depressing, <laughs> really. Yeah. yeah. But um, what other sort of challenges did you face working in the prison service in Northern Ireland during the Troubles? Well, I suppose um, my friends were saying, look, uh, it's a dangerous, potentially dangerous job. And it doesn't matter if you're going in there to do good things, um, you know, bringing psychology to prisoners and to, to staff and to try to change things for the better. You're perceived as the enemy of, of a particular group or another group. And in fact, both groups didn't see us as, as friendly. However, um, it took quite a lot of time as well for the staff to be able to acknowledge that their jobs were tough. And so I had to walk the landings, talk to people. And for the first couple of years, I was on my own. Uh, but I, I realized that going out and talking to people to overcome the barriers about it's OK not to feel OK sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's OK to have a reaction to a traumatic event. And that could be cutting down um, an offender, a prisoner in a cell or someone who's cut themselves badly, having to go into that cell and, and manage it, mm -hmm. which is why I realized their mental health was getting affected um, generally, but more specifically in conflict situations like the maze, because staff and prisoners were involved in many confrontation issues for various reasons. And very often I was actually locked in the maze or in Belfast prison as well, couldn't get home. So things, challenges were family um, responsibilities. I, I had um, three young children when I went into prisons in 1991. They were used to coming to university with me in the summer holidays and going to the library and enjoying the sports facilities. That couldn't happen in, in prisons. And even at home, um, uh, anyone connected with security forces didn't really talk about their job a lot, although I never hid it from my children what I did. Um, but they, they realized that there was an element of, of risk. And I hoped I was trying not to pass that on to them. Um, uh, However, as, as, as uh, someone had to use their car every day, we were always advised to check underneath our car. So there was a routine in the house where mummy looked under the car every morning um, and that was just part and parcel of what we did. And sometimes mm -hmm. I, would, I would get the children to, we, we live in a long lane, just to run to the end of the lane and pick them up. It was a game we had whereby I would drive the car first and they would, they, would, um, they would be picked up at the end of the lane just in case. So there were challenges, but I was joined by other really brave um, psychologists who had a great deal of um, experience, again, occupational um, and criminolo criminology, um, and they came from England to help out. And over time, then um, we became a more normal psychology service um, in terms of being able to offer um, various programs to prisoners. Uh, we didn't have a a parole board as such because um, uh, we had a life sentence review board and I served on that uh, as well because um, what you do for politically we had to treat everybody the same so the um, those that were convicted of terrorist offences refused to acknowledge any court so therefore no one could get to the parole board or a parole process in those days so we had life sentence review board and we didn't actually see the prisoners but we had reports from the, the governors and the landings, reports from probation head, and uh, we then introduced the idea of risk assessment uh, to the Life Sentence Review Board so that uh, other prisoners who were willing to go through assessment um, are, and uh, when they were going for release were actually seen by psychologists. And we had a good mix. We had clinical psychologists come and join us in the prison service. Um, and as well as, as uh, uh, the, the people who are working with staff. So we began to expand the team 
uh, and that was good. So how did you sort of seize all these opportunities? Because it sounds like you've got, you know, a family to look after, which is a full time job. And then, you know, so many different opportunities because you worked on the English parole board as well as the Northern Ireland one um, and your lecturing. I mean, you just how do you fit it all in? What's this your <laughs> secret? <laughs> organization i'm not i'm not the best in terms if you look around my, my office you would know i'm not organized with paperwork but every every day like all mothers you're thinking what's the next thing i have to do for tomorrow how do i organize my time how do we arrange pickups what about hockey what about games what about after schools what about pony club all those things that you have to do um and luckily um you know in my um uh earlier career um obviously um i had bags of energy and lots of help and i'd always like to acknowledge my child minder who was an amazing person uh we had the one child minder for all three children and actually after all ch three children left um uh uh the nest uh she was still with us so um we were very fortunate plus i had my parents um who were very supportive so when i was working up in Derry and lecturing in Derry. Uh, my parents would come up, pick up the children from the child minder and put them to bed. So again, it was about organizational um, skills to try and work everything through. My more recent uh, career with the Pro Board in the last 10 years, obviously um, the children had fled the nest and they were making their own way in the world. Uh, two of them did psychology, interestingly, one uh, simply refused and did veterinary science instead. <laughs> failed <laughs> but you know she uses psychology in her veterinary practice every single day <laughs> i'm so pleased like a better judgment <laughs> <laughs> can't escape it um so um yes i i applied for the pro board um because i knew that i'd need to do something when i finished my day job i didn't actually retire from prisons until i was 66 uh, some people thought i was going to retire at 60 but um uh, I stayed on because actually I thought there were a few more challenges I wanted to um, take on board and, um, and, and a few things I still wanted to um, see if we could move forward. And one of those things was developing young staff. And in uh, uh, over a period of time, uh, we got people onto various BPS routes and other routes like the HCPC routes. And we, we got, I suppose we moved from me being one in 1991 to somewhere around 35, 40 um, before I left. Now, unfortunately, uh, many of those people are leaving today because there's other opportunities, but that's a good thing as well as a bad thing. And I do think, and I really do think that prisons is one of the most challenging places to work. I think it can be emotionally draining. And one of the reasons um, uh, I went into the Pro Board, obviously I wanted to use my skill set as they talk about these days. And I wanted to be actively involved and to keep uh, my um, professional skills um, alive and, and uh, my CPD up to date. Um, but again, uh, the Pro Board um, is, you don't see many good stories. Um, you know, you're reading a lot of sad stories, both about people's lives as a victim and their lives as, a, as an offender. And that's very emotionally draining, I think. And so it's just like working in prison again. It can be very, very emotionally challenging. And we do need to support our forensic psychologists within the prison services and in uh, again in, in other other uh, areas like the NHS, because um, I think that's the key. Um, you know, I, I tried to embed in uh, in the prison service uh, not only support for staff, uh, psychology staff, but support for uh, prison staff. And interestingly, um, we had a very tragic death of a prisoner in uh, prison and he was uh, had been convicted of a terrorist offence. Um, but the staff came and said, um, I know they don't normally ask for psychological help, but we think they need some. So the message had got through after a period of time that psychology can help uh, most people uh, in most situations. And uh, we actually went in invited uh to to that group um who would never have uh, approached psychologists before mm. i'm an, i have an awful grasshopper mind jerry you're gonna have to keep no no that's really interesting no because that is so important i think that you know as part of you've done such a lot in your career but that is i would think really important because if we don't support the staff that work in prisons they're not going to be able to carry on working in them so you have to look after them. We can't have them coming out, dam or us coming out more damaged mm. by the work we do. It's just not, you know, that's not how it should be going to work. 
<laughs> but I, I think that. Sorry, Emily. I was going to say in the same hand you said about how we have to look after forensic psychologists and I just wondered in your experience what advice would you give to people going into the prison service or becoming forensic psychologists to how how can they look after themselves? I think they've got to be aware of the challenges that they will face I think they need to talk to people who are doing the job I think they need to be very realistic about the sorts of um, emotional challenges uh, within the job and to ask lots of questions. I think, you know, um, people are influenced that it looks quite sexy in a, a, a general sense. It's popular, sorry, that's a better word. It's very popular, but I do think they have to be careful that the reality of working in prisons is there um, because on a day and daily basis, staff are facing people with um, a multitude of complex problems. And we're also going into those environments um, and I think really nationally um, staff have not been recognized as needing that type of clinical support uh, and for um, because if uh, again uh, we know the complex needs of the individual we're dealing with but I don't think civil servants understand that because they're not in the landings they don't see the the difficult and very traumatic events that staff have to deal with mm -hmm. and um, if they're taking that home it's not going to be a very healthy environment so again for um, forensic psychologists coming along do your homework do your research make sure it's for you and don't plan to stay in for 24 years because <laughs> you get all these wrinkles <laughs> i'm only 34 <laughs> oh you look beautiful for 34 <laughs> So one of your um, other great accomplishments is winning competitions for water skiing. I mean, there's like no end to your talents. <laughs> Back to my earlier question. Is there anything you can't do? <laughs> lots I can't do. Lots I can't do. I can't play the tin whistle. I've tried many times. <laughs> well, I'm, struggling. Hey, look. <laughs> I'm, struggling, struggling, I'm struggling with learning Irish yeah. uh, because it's an incredibly complicated language, but I'm enjoying the struggle as well. I've been doing that since 1991 as well. I thought it might help in the job actually, <laughs> way back in the time, but it hooked me in and I've, I've really enjoyed uh, working. And I, I, we now do it in Zoom, which is uh, slightly easier. Um, so going back to the question, I've always been a very physical person. I, I actually joined a, a gym, but never went because actually I much prefer to go out and dig the garden or go out in the horses or go and do something physical. And at school, I played a lot of hockey. I went to an all girls school. And of course, um, I was on the first 11 um, as soon as they would let me. Um, and uh, I was very committed to that. And I did judo and karate uh, as an adult at university. And at university, they offered free um, or very subsidized um, water skiing at, um, on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, it was a very short period of time because, as you know, in those days, you, you, um, your term finished in May and we only really started water skiing at the beginning of May. So it was very short. But over that period of time, uh, I really enjoyed it and got reconnected with the club um, many years later, actually, the same club just by accident. And uh, again, was dipping in and out because with parole board work, I was away a lot. Uh, I was across the water a lot, as we say here. And um, but with lockdown, um, I was actually getting more time to ski because I wasn't on an aeroplane going back and forth to England. And um, uh, someone suggested me entering a league. And I went, well, I mean, I, a league, what would, what would I do? And they said, well, you slalom. And I said, well, I've never learned to slalom. Um, I've just had it, you know, I can stay up and I can go on one ski and I can cross wakes and have a bit of fun, but I've never learned to do slalom. So they said, well, you know, get out in the water and have a go. So I did. And then I was entered for this league and it was an all Ireland league and it was an open competition. So I was competing against people of a different age group from me. And there was no, there was no bottom or top to this. Uh, in terms of age group span and uh, so I happened to get third overall in Ireland now it was the you know it was the basic league it wasn't like a top league but I was so pleased and uh, about three or four weeks ago we went down to uh, Dunleary to pick up my trophy oh at last 2020 because yeah. uh, we, were, we weren't able to have a prize giving between that so yes I love water skiing I love snow skiing I love uh, any sport uh, and we try to do that with our family snow skiing especially everybody uh, even the grandchildren are getting involved so we all like to do that together and it's a, it's a great family um, uh, it's, a way, it's a great way to spend family time that's fantastic you're so, you're so inspirational even more so than when we started out <laughs> and is there any other roles that we haven't really talked about that you've done in your very no. varied career 
I, I did work with Jamie Dornan's dad, <laughs> as you probably know, it was uh, Jamie Dornan's dad was a, um, a gynecologist obstetrician, uh, a very lovely man who's unfortunately passed um, with COVID. Um, but uh, he and I knew each other uh, just through other friends, again, Northern Ireland, very small place. And uh, we suggested we could work together for the benefit of uh, the, um, his, his client uh, population. So we had some students uh, of mine uh, and me uh, getting involved in, in uh, some work with Jim and uh, Prof uh, Professor Thompson at the Royal Maternity Unit, um, because um, he was actually interested in psychology as well. It wasn't my experience when I was having my babies that anybody was interested in the psychological aspects of childbirth, <laughs> but uh, Jim, uh, Jim Dornan was, and uh, he, again, we were influencing his department to look at uh, the process that women were going through in a much more psychological way. I think today it's better, um, mm -hmm. but um, I'd like to think it's improving. But I have heard that, you know, there's still a long way to go in terms of um, uh, gynecologists not seeing as a medical model, but there's a psychological mm -hmm. element there that need to be attended to uh, pre-birth and, and during birth and post-birth. Um, mm -hmm. I think we need to pay much more attention to that. Um, so yeah, that's my claim to fame. I, I did meet Jermaine Greer once in Belfast. Oh. <laughs> hey, that was so cool. She said, she said she loved my eyes. Now, I wasn't quite sure what she was saying, but she said, I think she's talking about the colour, so it's okay. <laughs> they are a bit orange, actually. My oh, orange, I reckon my eyes go back to Genghis Khan. <laughs> yeah, it's a really unusual coloured eyes, haven't you? I don't know what else I need to say, honestly. Uh, you've, been very, <laughs> you've been very gracious in terms of your time. I think actually the other thing I did forget to mention was um, uh, very early on in the 90s, I discovered EMDR, which was being used by the police in Northern Ireland. Uh, 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 someone who was um, uh, well, a student of mine, actually, uh, Dr. Michael Patterson, had himself been a policeman, got injured, uh, came to the University of Ulster and uh, trained as a clinical psychologist afterwards and um, then started to train other people in EMDR. So I was using EMDR quite early, as were my colleagues in the prison service, although we were still a bit wary because it seemed it seemed uh, you know, way ahead of its time, but now it's, yeah. it's very popular. And I'm so pleased that people are using EMDR mm. prisons uh, for all sorts of um, people with, with different types of backgrounds. Um, uh, and also I, I did a, I did a, a few years um, training as a psychodynamic uh, counselor, psychotherapist. And that was a challenge because when I did psychology way back in the six, 1968, um, we were told never analyze, never interpret. You're here to just do scientific, um, uh, well-researched, uh, evidence-based, and don't ever dream of um, trying to interpret. So I went along to this psychodynamic training and I found it really challenging. Mm. And uh, my, my lecturer, trainer, um, and mentor said, oh God, not a psychologist, they question everything. <laughs> just go with it Jackie just consider it Jackie and actually I mean now with EMDR and the connections with mm -hmm. psychodynamic and the past influencing and trauma mm -hmm. you know it was it was time well spent and I struggled but I got there in the end and I, mm. I love the challenge uh, and I do think that I suppose uh, for, for younger people coming through don't I mean I think it's very difficult because, you know, the routes to stage two, or oh, by the way, as an assessor for stage two as well. And I, I also did the visits to universities and, and uh, went out and checked out for the BPS and uh, HCPC, the, the courses that are being run um, mostly on the big island. And um, I, I really feel that young people um, uh, really need a lot more support to get through these various routes. I think, uh, you know, in my day, um, there wasn't really that clear route. So I actually did 10 years before I actually went for registration as a forensic psychologist, because actually in the early nineties, it was legal and criminological psychology. I'm not sure when we started to call ourselves forensic, mm. um, but then everything became quite complicated. And actually um, Ruth Mann was one of my mentors to get me through what was then chartership. Um, but it was so much, uh, it was based on your experience. You had to write up your experience similar to today, but somehow or other, it seemed to work quite well in terms of um, being able to present your information in a different way. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just, uh, I, I actually applaud 
uh, young um, would-be forensic psychologists for the commitments they make, putting off all sorts of important issues in order to get chartered first. And my heart went out to them actually when I was an assessor because I felt there must be an easier way of doing this and maybe the BPS has come up with that easier solution now. And mm -hmm. certainly it should be time bound it so that people aren't 14 years later working uh, through the, the, the route to chartership. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really important. And um, Michael Patterson's work's quite widely available on YouTube, actually. He's fascinating to watch, and I always like watching him because he's um, in Ireland when he's, well, I always picture he's in Ireland when he's got an Irish accent, but um, he's always got this lovely scenery behind him while he's talking, and so you sort of relax just looking at the scenery. Um, but he's, um, but it was when he put his hand up, and I thought, oh, my goodness, you've lost your hand, and then he put the other hand, I thought, oh, you lost them both. And, you know, so he's obviously had major injuries, um, but his EMDR, skills and how he describes them are just excellent so if you were one of his lecturers well done because <laughs> the way he imparts the knowledge is he's so down to earth and he just does it in such an easy to understand manner um, but yeah he, I think that's Michael's natural style I mean such a, an amazing person to have mm -hmm. suffered such injuries mm -hmm. and to be on such pos he's he's used his experience to do such positive things using yeah. psychology yeah. Uh, I have the greatest admiration for him because I think it's uh it's outstanding. Uh, he has been acknowledged with a, a formal um, um, you know, uh, MBE, but oh, in, my, in my mind, he, he deserves way higher than that. <laughs> and he's trained a lot of people in Ireland. Uh, we now have an All-Ireland EMDR group, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the UK group, and obviously we're affiliated to both. Mm -hmm. um, but he is a very inspirational um, individual, and I speak to him uh, on a regular basis. Yeah, he's definitely a very inspirational person. Um, well, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. And congratulations on your very well-deserved award. And, you know, again, it, it, your winning a British Psychological Society Award really raises the profile of forensic psychology. So we're really proud of you on behalf of all forensic psychologists. Yeah. And uh, we look forward to presenting the uh, award at the conference. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, you'll probably get presented somewhere else as well, but we will also present it. <laughs> that would be lovely, Jerry. And I'm not saying this for myself. I'm just thinking as a general rule. Uh, we was, I was delighted that we managed to present Ruth with hers yeah, uh, personally and to um, just have her there for yeah. uh, that, that particular evening. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I mean, I, I think that um, and, and uh, for those that uh, put me forward for this award, I'm eternally grateful. And, and I was very shocked and overwhelmed by, by uh, such an award. But I am so pleased that it's a forensic award. And I'm also pleased that it's for Northern Ireland, I have to say. Mm, yeah, <laughs> having, no. having served 50 years or something in the BPS, I'm, I'm delighted that, uh, <laughs> that that award has come back to Northern Ireland. That's really great. Thank you. Thank oh, Jackie, thank you so much. You're an absolute inspiration. Yeah. It's been We're very grateful to have you on the channel. Emily, I think you're fairly inspirational yourself. Oh. As is <laughs> yeah, she definitely is. <laughs> definitely is. Oh. It just remains for us to say, let's talk forensic psychology. Yeah.